Hey everybody, Brian Bush, Top Crop Alliance. We're checking wheat fields. Trying to get some insights out here, see what we're finding. We had a wheat meeting here a couple weeks ago. Great time, Scott Eversker did an awesome job presenting information on wheat for us. Thank you everybody that made it out to that meeting. I hope y'all took away something positive from that. Since not everybody could make it, I wanted to share some of the highlights that Scott talked through. So I think there's some important points for us to consider as we think about wheat management going into 2024. So, first things first. Did you know recently there's a wheat record set? World record wheat, 267 bushel wheat. Unbelievable to think about that. Didn't come in the US, it was actually set in England. A couple key points about that. 267 is it's unfathomable. But number one, five inch rows. They had a five inch row planter, so sort of planting the seeds. Same depth, uniform spacing. That's going to be part of it. But I think the bigger piece for us is sulfur. On that 267 bushel wheat, that farmer applied 70 pounds of sulfur. So let's just kind of get back to the reality a little bit. We're not going to plant on 260 bushel wheat, but 130. But well, last year we saw some 130 bushel wheat out there in places. So if we just cut the numbers in half, how many of you today are applying 35 pounds of sulfur to your wheat? So if you do kind of the backwards math there, that's roughly what it would have taken to grow his. Um, I don't think 35 is the right number, but if you're not in that 25 to 30 pounds range of sulfur, that's what Scott was saying, that's what we should probably be targeting to make sure we got enough sulfur to go along with our nitrogen our management on these crops, on the, on the wheat to go out there. So, something to consider there, right? Because I would have never thought it was that much sulfur. Also kind of makes my head go towards corn and soybeans also to eat more sulfur on those crops. Because that may be part of our limiting factors. <laughs> so, wheat yields. Another thing, through some of the research, what they're finding is, in row, putting phosphorus in the row can be a, a, a five to seven bushel increase. So if you're planting, I'm not saying you need to put, a, you know, stream it on there, or, sorry, stream not the right word, put in furrow uh, with liquid, um, but if you're putting phosphorus out there, it's putting phosphorus closer to the rows, it's going to help with our yields more. You know, why do we put phosphorus on with corn? Well, typically phosphorus is tied up in cold soils. We only grows in cold soils. <laughs> so if it starts greening up and taking off again, having the phosphorus closer to those roots and a higher concentration closer to the roots might be a way to help us increase our yield potential, yield expectations from a wheat perspective there. That's an interesting takeaway. Um, next, hybrid wheat's coming. Scott talked about actually walking research plots out in the countryside uh, that Pioneer has where well, there's hybrid wheat there. So it's not out of the question that in the next seven to 10 years, we might be planting hybrid wheat um, and the yield's there to pay for it. And the cost, he said, from kind of talking through it where everybody's at, will be also reasonable enough that we'll be looking at this as well. So hybrid wheat's not as far out there. It's not that pipe dream that uh, it's been talked about for years and years and years. It's actually maybe coming sooner than what we think. One more important point before I jump into the deeper part of it here. We talked through last year. Temperature versus moisture. What helps make our wheat yield more? Scott's big takeaway was, it doesn't matter how much moisture we have. Independent of moisture, a cooler temperature during May, during June, is probably what helps us see higher yield potential, like we saw last year. So even though we were hot and dry, or sorry, we were cooler but dry, Scott said if I had to pick one of the two, I would always pick cooler temperatures having a bigger influence on our yield potential than I would the moisture availability, yes or no. So some pretty neat takeaways. Now the other important thing to talk about here, he spent a good, good amount of time on it, was palisade. Wheat and you're not using palisade, let's talk. Palisade is a growth regulator. What it actually does, it inhibits gibberellic acid production inside the plant. Gibberellic acid is what makes the plants elongate. It helps with stem growth, shoot growth above ground. In the past that I've worked with it, um, the, the comment was it's an art. You gotta find it when the crop's growing quickly, but not too quickly. You put on too early, it doesn't work, too late, you can inhibit yield. One well, of the great things Scott talked about was in his area, Southern Illinois, where they grow wheat every single year. Um, they, they've almost fine-tuned it down that it's not as complicated as what it was made out to be in the past. So first things first, the label for Palisade says from Feeks 4 to Feeks 8. 
look around me here, kind of that, that green up, becoming erect leaves, this is that stage. This is Feeks 4 right now. So based on the label, you could theoretically go out today and put on Palisade and be on label. I would recommend you not to do that. Don't do that yet. Because Palisade works by inhibiting tuberulic acid as the plants are growing. Does this feel greened up over the past week? No question it has. But we're not growing that quick yet. We're we'll waiting too late to get to uh, Peaks 8, which when the flyleaf is visible, it's still rolling up inside the world there. Then we actually have the head inhibiting. You spray Palisade, it inhibits that head development by inhibiting jubilant acid production. That's bad. So don't do that either. So that fine tuning spacing in there is more about Peaks 6, which is the first node visible. Right here at the soil line, you'll go down, we can take plants apart, and you'll feel that bump, which is the first node, or first joint, you'll find out there. Wheat has two nodes that show up there above the, the ground line. If we spray it, peak six, typically it's later into April. Because it's later into April, it's warmer temperatures, better growth, more consistent warm temperatures, the wheat taking off. You spray the palisade there for one reason, I guess two reasons. Number one, to keep the plant shorter. Why does that matter? Well, the chance of it going down. But number two, the main reason why you put it on, is so you put on more nitrogen. Scott talked about nitrogen in wheat. It's almost a one-to-one -one number. One pound of nitrogen, one bushel yield potential. Palisade allows us to put on more nitrogen, but keep that wheat from falling down, getting too much top growth and going down, because nobody wants down wheat. So, um, Big, big picture. If you're thinking about Palisade, we'll keep scouting the fields. Really, when we get to April, we'll continue to scout until we find that first node, that first joint, kind of above the soil surface here. That's our time to spray the Palisade. It's probably a separate pass, which is unfortunate. But if we're pushing yield potential, and 2023 showed us we can have better yields than we would have ever thought possible if the weather plays with us. So, normal that, we'll stay in touch on Palisade. Um, any other questions on wheat, please let me know. Um, happy to talk to you guys and hope this is helpful. Have a good day.